Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. This is part one in a three part series on Burp Proxy. In this video, I'm going to go through the basics of setting up and using Burp. This is by far the most commonly used tool for web security for good reason. It has a lot of features and can be a bit overwhelming, but I hope you'll have a better idea of how to go about using it by the end of this video. Before we jump right in, let's talk a little bit about what Burp is and what it can do for you. Burp proxy is a man in the middle proxy, which means that it sits between your browser or other client and web servers. It's able to intercept all the requests, letting you see and manipulate everything going over the wire. We're also going to be making use of Firefox for reasons we'll go over later, so make sure you have that installed before we begin. To get started, go to portspigger.net slash burp and download the community edition. This is the free version of Burp containing many of the key features, but does lack some advanced things and nice to have functions. The next two videos in the series will be primarily focused on those features from Professional, but you only need community to follow along today. I recommend making use of the installer for your platform as this simplifies things over downloading the plain jar file. Beyond that, installation is pretty straightforward. So in the interest of time, I'll skip over the actual installation. Starting up Burp, you'll notice that you're presented with a screen to select your project type and such. In Community, the only type supported is a temporary project, so you can just click Next. For now, we're going to use the default configuration, but this window allows you to use saved configurations as well in the future. This allows you to tweak Burp to your liking and carry that from project to project with ease. Definitely play around with that later. Now we'll go ahead and click Start Burp. Now we're presented with one big scary interface. Let's go ahead and set up Firefox to connect through Burp and see if we can load a page or two before we break down this interface. In the options under the Proxy tab, we can see that it's currently listening on localhost port 8080. One note, you may see your running checkbox be unchecked. If this is the case, that's likely due to something else listening on port 8080, as this is often the default for local web servers. In that case, just change the port to one that's not in use and click the running checkbox to make it listen on that port. In our case, we're good with 8080, so we'll move ahead. We go to the Options menu in Firefox, scroll all the way to the bottom of General, then click Settings. We'll use a manual configuration pointing all of the protocols at localhost 8080. And refreshing a page, it almost works. Unfortunately, Firefox says that the site has an invalid SSL certificate and certificate pinning is enabled, so we can't override that. Before we move on though, this is a good time to point out that this is the major reason Firefox is the de facto testing browser. It has its own proxy settings. Most other browsers require you to set system-wide proxy settings, which is a huge pain for a multitude of reasons. Firefox is, by far, the clear winner in this regard. As for the certificate issue, we can get around that pretty easily. We'll download the certificate authority from my own burp instance and install that. This is key just to your installation, so if you trust the certificate, only your burp proxy can man in the middle you. That said, probably best to only accept this in test browser instances, not where you deal with your production email, banking, etc. By going to http colon slash slash burp, we get a very simple little interface where we can download the certificate. Going back to Firefox options and then to the bottom of Privacy and Security, we can find the View Certificates button. From here, we just hit Import and select the file Burp gave us. We'll only let it be valid for websites for now. Now if we refresh the page we tested earlier, you'll notice that it hangs now. That's exactly what we expect. By default, Burp Proxy starts in the Intercept mode. This means that it catches outgoing requests and prevents them from actually going through until you say so. So we switch over to burp, hit the intercept tab, and just turn that off. Now the request is sent through and the page loads. 
Now that we have burp set up for our purposes, let's take a look at this interface. We'll start with a quick overview of each feature tab. These are, roughly speaking, set up in the order in which most testers will use the tools. First we have the target tab, which allows you to see a tree view of all the domains and paths you've viewed, as well as specify the scope of your testing. Next we have the proxy tab, which contains the interceptor, which allows you to view and manipulate web requests as they're in flight. The HTTP history, which shows you all the requests that the proxy has seen from your browser. WebSockets history, which shows the messages sent over WebSockets. And a multitude of options. Then we have the spider, which can sometimes find some really useful pages and functionality you may have otherwise missed. We're going to skip over the scanner tool as this is only in Burp Pro. The next video will discuss this in detail. In the next tab, Intruder lets you perform large numbers of requests for various automated testing scenarios. And again, next video we'll talk about that in detail. Next, Repeater is used to repeat existing requests and manipulate them to test for a multitude of bugs. This is, personally, my favorite feature of Burp. The Sequencer allows you to capture or load a set of tokens and assess them for flaws in various ways. And the Decoder lets you decode and encode data as Base64, Hex, etc. This is super useful and we'll talk about it in a bit. Finally, Comparer lets you compare two blocks of data, as the name might indicate. The other tabs are primarily options, and we'll talk about bits of that as we go on. Now, let's dive in a bit deeper. Let's start with the Target tab. In the site map, we can see a number of pages I've viewed in this session. We can do a number of things from here, and you should absolutely explore it. But for now, let's focus on a couple of key things. First, you'll notice that some of these are showing up in gray. What that means is that the burp spider, which is always passively watching, found a reference to this page, but no requests actually hit it. This could mean that it's an erroneous link, or it could be a piece of functionality that we just haven't seen yet. One of the more important things you can do in this view, though, is to use it to easily set the scope of testing. Before you get started with the test, you typically know which domains are in and out of scope, and Burp really helps us out here. If we right-click on one of the branches on the left, we can tell it to add that to the scope. Burp will ask you if you only want to save history for in-scope items, and most of the time you're going to say yes to this. Now that we have our scope cleared up, let's take a look at the Proxy tab. The HTTP history is probably where I spend about half my time when I'm in Burp. Here I can see all the requests that have gone through my proxy, or I can filter by MIME type or extension, and more. I definitely want to see only end scope items here for my purposes, so I'll set that now. For each of these requests, I can see not only what my client set, but the response that the server sent back as well, in various different views. Switching gears to something quite different, the Intercept tab holds one of the more fun tools. By clicking to enable interception, you're able to see all requests and responses and manipulate them as you see fit. For instance, let's refresh this page and then change the request to ask the server for a different level. We change the data and then forward it along, and there we have it, a different page than the one the browser originally requested. The full use of Interceptor is out of scope for this video, but it's invaluable for things like header manipulation. It should be noted though that if you're changing server responses and only then see something that looks like a bug, you might not actually be seeing a real bug. This is a common mistake newer testers make. What's coming from burp to your browser after manipulation of responses only affects your browser, nothing else. One thing that's important to know is that Burp decides which requests and responses to intercept based on these options. You can set up quite complex controls to ensure that only the things you care about get intercepted, otherwise you just get bogged down in a lot of requests you're not interested in at all. 
By default, it also only intercepts requests rather than responses, but this can be easily enabled here. Here I'm intercepting the response and changing some text on the page, as you can see. And this leads into another proxy option, match and replace. This is one of my absolute favorite burp features. This allows you to automatically replace header values and body data for requests and or responses. If you want to say, disable a piece of JavaScript code, simply match it and replace it with an empty string or a different function call, as the case may be. If you want to simulate different user agents, that's trivial here as well. Here we'll set up a simple replacement of some text on the page. Let's change student center to something else. We just add a new match selector, select the response body, and type in our match and replace values. And when we refresh, you see it right there. The uses of this are practically infinite, especially when you start doing regex matches. Another useful feature is the unhide hidden form fields option. This does exactly what it says. It turns hidden form fields into text inputs. As you can see from this breaker profile page, there's a CSERF field here. Now, I personally like to enable the prominently highlight unhidden fields option, since it shows you the field name, not just a bare text box. But they aren't kidding when they say prominent, as you can see. Now we'll move on to my absolute favorite feature of Burp, Repeater. What this allows you to do is execute HTTP requests and see their responses. This sounds trivial, but being able to directly tamper with requests opens you up to testing that you can't really accomplish any other way easily. As you can see, just going to this tab presents you with an editable request field and very little else. Going to repeater directly is rarely done unless you're copying a request from some other app or some such. Rather, let's go back to history and have some fun. I selected a page that looks like it has some interesting inputs, right clicked, and hit send to repeater. Now that tab actually has some contents. If I click go, I can clearly see the response right there. Now, there's only one input I can see on this page, the ID field in the query string, but is there anything fun I can do? Well, if I copy it from the request and search for it in the response, I clearly see it come up in one place, a tag attribute. Maybe plain old reflected XSS will work here. Type a quote and hit go and, hey, that's not escaped on response. Seems like probable XSS to me. When I'm actually testing a site, almost all of my time is split between the proxy history and the repeater, just finding an interesting request, sending it over here, and tampering with every value. It's fast, you can go forward and backward, and you can see exactly what you're trying to do. Also, if you select some text and hit Control u or Command u on Mac, it'll automatically URL encode key characters. That's much more convenient than when you're trying to test in browser and need to do that yourself. I use the browser to explore the site and find all the pages, then I do most of the heavy lifting right inside of Repeater. Last but not least, we'll take a quick look at the decoder. We'll copy this CSERF token from the breaker profile page and see what it might decode to. It certainly looks like hex, so let's see. Sure enough, it decodes to a little Easter egg, followed by some random looking data. Just to show an example, you can also encode this as you see fit, and apply hashes. This is a really handy tool, and you'll find more uses for it down the line. Well, that wraps it up for this session. I hope this helped you get a better understanding of Burp, and I hope you'll watch the next videos in the series for more information. As always, thanks for watching, and happy breaking!